Hello, Jondo. Hello, Kevin. So we've talked about habits um, directly and indirectly in the last couple of episodes and some main principles of FM Alexander's. So let's talk about end gaining. Uh, he wrote that end gaining is a universal habit. And there's a quote attributed to him where he says, this end gaining business has got to the point it's worse than a drug. So what is end gaining and why is it so bad? Yeah. Um, well, you have to understand uh, the system of concept and uh, that Alexander is working with. And so the best, uh, the best way is to start with uh, first a quote uh, from him, uh, where it's, it's in the, the second book, he's introducing the idea. And um, I will go through it. And we will see that um, in his last book, at the end of his uh, life, well, of his, well, it was nearing the end of his uh, teaching practice, he, he made another uh, attempt at defining the end gaining principle. And so it's interesting to contrast the two and to see what, what it is we can, we can understand and how we can use the concept properly and uh, if we do so, we will also understand that there are improper ways to, uh, to use that to, well, to just uh, condemn people with the end gaining principle. So uh, the first uh, thing is uh, the connection that exists between the end gaining principle, of course, and the means whereby principle. The sentence is whenever a person sets out to achieve a particular end, whether this end is the development of potentialities or the eradications of defects, peculiarities, misuse, his procedure will be based on one of the two principles, which I have called the end gaining and the means whereby principle. So here we have uh, the start of a misunderstanding. Um, and gaining is not about uh, doing things, wanting to do things. It's the manner, it's the mental attitude, the person that wants to change, that wants to uh, eradicate defects, for example, it's the way the person is going to go about doing things. It's not uh, this modern idea that uh, end gaining is, uh, is just the, the desire to do things or the desire to change. Of course not. For Alexander, uh, we have to do things. We are doing things all the time. And uh, we may discover that uh, because we have to do things, we have to move the different parts of the organism in order to live, it's not uh, a problem. We cannot decide at one moment that it should be best to lie down on the floor all the time, not doing anything. No, Alexander hasn't got that idea at all. Uh, he never lied down during the day, ever. Yes? So, you, are, uh, you want to change something, and then Alexander observes the mental attitude, so the end gaining is a, a mental set as well as the means whereby uh, set is another mental attitude. So um, now it, it's better to start basically to, to look at a, a, a practical case because uh, with Alexander's definitions, and here we must note that this idea of end gaining and means whereby this, this, uh, this word that he, Alexander is using all the time, he invented. Uh, so you have to go into Alexander's head to understand what it is. You have, there is no, uh, I, I mean, philosophical text about end gaining because it was invented by Alexander himself. And so it's very important to uh, start 
this way that is going back to the text to understand. But as soon as you've, you've started to look at the text, then you need to contextualize because, uh, well, uh, what it means is not very clear. So I wanted to take an example, a very simple example. So this is how I, I, I will explain and gaining. So now we have a, a very common situation. There is a person that is lifting the arm. So we see that this person is involved in some body, body technique, body work, and she's lifting the arms. But we are not interested in what she's doing to the other person. But what we are interested in is uh, what is happening to the mechanism of the torso when she's doing so. And uh, we can uh, say, because we've seen that person do the same gesture many, many times, and every single time uh, she reproduces the same movements with the middle part of the torso relatively to the upper and lower part of the torso. Every time she does uh, this gesture, we see that uh, in order to perform the gesture, she in fact uh, has a, a set of coordinated movements that are not movements of the arms or the shoulders, but are movements of the different parts of the torso. And as a result of these movements of the part of the torso, uh, of course, the torso has the spine inside, the whole spine, and if the top of the whole spine is brought back, well, it's absolutely clear that the head of the person is going to be brought back and down as a result of the different movements of the part of the mechanism of the torso, that the person without, without knowing it certainly as associated with a simple movement. So we are, we are facing a habit. And uh, if the person sees uh, the video recording her actions, she will see that yes, she's not aware that she's doing these things. She doesn't really want to shorten the back in this way and pull, uh, in fact, the neck and, in fact, uh, shorten the muscle of the shoulders that are, in fact, muscles that are attached to the head. And uh, the shortening of the muscle, we know, introduce a rigidity in the neck that is um, improper. There is no reason that the person should inflict upon herself this conditions of what we call use, which, which in fact means conditions of movements of the different parts when she tries to help someone else. So that person uh, at that moment has a decision to make. It's how to change. There is uh, the options of that the person has are more than she thinks. Alexander, in fact, expands the possibilities by saying that there are two principles and not only one. Uh, the one principle would, do say, would say to, to, to work more, uh, to wait until a way uh, succeeds, to, to trust that it will come. Uh, but that is only one way and apparently that person has been involved in this game for some time and apparently the solution is still not there. How, how long? Because the more she waits, the more she trusts, well, uh, she's practicing the wrong movements all the time. She's developing the wrong habit. So uh, if she continues like that, well, uh, our options are reducing and not expanding because habits grow on the meat they are, they are feed on. And so she's feeding a habit with uh, the wrong decisions of movement. So Alexander suddenly introduces something. And so when we look at the end gaining principle, we have to understand that through understanding the end gaining principle, we uh, obtain a new way uh, at looking at things, a new way at uh, dealing with habits. So that's, that's the first thing. So uh, we don't use the, the end gaining principle to blame or to, uh, you know, uh, well, tell people that they are wrong 
No, we use the end gaining principle to uh, understand better, in fact, how the whole idea of changing habits is, uh, it can be intellectualized and can guide our way of doing things. So, uh, of course, we need to understand uh, how Alexander sees the end gaining principle. So he, th that's his definition. The, this is another sentence. Uh, the end gaining principles involves a direct procedure on the part of the person endeavoring to gain the desired end. This direct procedure is associated with dependence upon subconscious guidance and control leading in cases where a condition of malcoordination is present to an unsatisfactory use of the mechanisms and to an increase in the defects and particularities already existing. So, Alexander could have been clearer, of course, but uh, when you want to uh, precise a meaning, when you want to make something very clear, you can't use uh, simple sentences. You can't use uh, uh, just uh, basic ideas because you're trying to define a complex idea. So let's go back and see. Uh, so we start with this idea that the person that has the habit of uh, uh, moving the different parts of the torso in a certain way when raising the arm um, wants to change, wants to stop, wants to do better, wants to improve, you know. It's not stopping the doing. The person still wants to lift the arms in order to, for example, put a book somewhere or touch the head of someone. Uh, and um, there is in the end gaining principle, this idea of direct procedure, is that all she needs to do is to feel what she's doing when she's lifting her arms and uh, in fact uh, decide to feel differently. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, so he explained that uh, this is what we call the dependence upon subconscious guidance and control. Subconscious guidance and control, it's very simple. It's the guidance by feeling. It's what you feel that is uh, uh, helping you to create the proper activity. So that is a very deep mental habit that we have, is that uh, if you see that a person is lifting the arm and bending the torso backward, well, it's very simple to think that uh, that person is equivocated, that her feelings are incorrect, and so you should give her the correct feeling so that she can guide the movements correctly. Well, Alexander points out the fact that uh, if the person is already uh, arching the back when just lifting the arm in the air, well, it means that, that the sensory appreciation, the, the, the way that person um, evaluates what she feels in order to guide movements is clearly inappropriate. So wanting to base the re-education on making her feel correct things uh, starts from the wrong premises because uh, it means that uh, we expect the person, when we make her feel the correct thing, that she will be able to feel these correct things as we, as we maybe feel them, which uh, apparently she can't because uh, she's, uh, she's clearly reproducing wrong movements. So, when we say a direct procedure, Alexander suggests that there is very little reasoning. There is a reasoning, of course, that we think, okay, the, the, that person has wrong sensations, she's guided by wrong sensation, we just need to give her the correct sen sensation so that then everything will be fine. There is a, a very basic reasoning, but uh, that reasoning is not grounded correctly. That reasoning is incorrect, is not logical. So if the person continues 
to try and base a change, a reeducation, if you want, reeducation of the uh, movement of the anatomical structure, uh, she's going to increase the defects and not uh, lessen them. So there is a problem with the end gaining system. It's that um, most teachers that are using the end gaining system uh, forget that uh, the person needs to reason out, to um, represent, model, how the movements she is doing are related together, how they are in fact concerted, how one movement influences another, and the fact that that person certainly needs, when she understands the movements, to command, to command all the movement at the same time. And uh, commanding a series of movements is uh, the idea of the means whereby principle. It's the, uh, the new revolutionary way that the young Alexander started to apply on himself. Uh, he found out that uh, trying to improve according to what he felt was uh, doomed to failure. It was failing. It was increasing the defects. It was increasing the habits. And so at that moment, he, he had this uh, realization. So that's how he defined the means whereby principle that is associated with the end gaining principles like the other face of the coin. And he says the means whereby principle, on the other hand, involves a reasoning consideration of the causes of the conditions present and an indirect instead of a direct procedure on the part of the person endeavoring to gain the desired end. So let's say the desired end again is uh, the prevention of the wrong movements of the different parts of the torso when lifting the arm. So a reasoning consideration of the causes of the condition present starts with uh, the first element is that up till now, the person has been guided by feeling. Is the guidance by feeling trustworthy? Well, up to that point, no. And there is no indication that it could be uh, appropriate later. Because the idea very often is to say that if that person that is lifting the arm and arching the back, if that person was given a correct feeling, meaning that uh, when she is lifting the hand, somebody, a somatic teacher, would come and in fact direct with these hands, the different parts of the mechanism of the torso of that person, so that that person will start lifting the arm very high in the air without lifting uh, the shoulders, without arching uh, the back, the upper torso backward, and the middle torso protruding forward. Uh, she will not re release the abductors of the legs and all this. Uh, that has been tried before. It's even the case that the person we saw that was arching the back when she was lifting the arms, well, uh, this person has done a three-year training course in the same um, somatic uh, imprinting of the correct sensation and that is based on the idea that uh, once this is done and repeated sufficiently, well, then the person should be able to lift the arm without arching the back and uh, it's not working. She's still arching the back, which is uh, somehow um, a proof. Well, that's the proof I, I, I saw when I was trained. I said, but in fact, uh, at the end of the three-year training course, uh, it's not working. This idea of transmitting a correct sensory appreciation associated with an act is still based on the end gaining principle. It's still uh, this idea of not reasoning uh, the causes of the conditioned presence. 
So the causes of the condition present are one, as I said, the sensory appreciation of the person that is not a real about a reliable guide. But there is a second one: is that um, the person has no idea of that there are movements of the different parts of the torso that are leading to that result. She does not uh, understand these movements. She cannot represent how these movements are linked together. And so, as long as she does not, if she's not able to do that, she cannot understand uh, the next part of the, of the quote because uh, uh, Alexander defined the means whereby principle as a reasoning consideration of the cause of the condition present. But then he adds, this indirect procedure is that psychophysical activity associated with constructive conscious guidance and control and with the consequent satisfactory use of the mechanisms which establishes the conditions essential to the increases, increasing development of potentialities under these conditions defects, peculiarities and misuse are not likely to be present within the organism. The sentence is so convoluted that I think that you can make it say whatever you want because you are pretty sure that person are not going to go in the details and really study what it means. So uh, this uh, attempt at being very precise, I think I had the exact opposite effect. <laughs> Nobody cared uh, about these books because uh, you, you can't make sense of them and it's too complex and you can't relate them to something you understand. So if somebody comes and say to you, Yes, this is exactly what Alexander said, and this is the indirect procedure is exactly to communicate a feeling to a person so that she has a correct sensor appreciation to base a movement on. Everybody would welcome that because it's better than uh, not understanding uh, what the sentence means. And so, uh, of course, you understand that uh, when I started to translate these books, well, I started to look at these sentences with, uh, with, well, suspicion. I, I started to suspect that uh, what I had been trained, the principles uh, I had been trained, were different from the one that are explained in the books. And that is absolutely strange and, and really crazy because uh, Alexander was teaching with his hands. Alexander started after 1917 to change his, uh, his teaching pedagogy and he started to, in fact, want to transmit the correct sensory appreciation to the person directly. So, uh, this really made no sense. Um, you will find that the indirect procedure uh, about which he's talking about here that psychophysical activity associated with constructive conscious guidance and control and with the consequent satisfactory use of the mechanism. Well, it's possible reading the books to find out where he's talking about that psychophysical activity associated with constructive conscious guidance and control that is not explained here that is not presented here. Here is just presenting like the, the resume, the, you know, the compacted uh, idea that has been explained elsewhere. If you don't try and get to the bottom of this, and if you don't go around in the book to find where about, does he speak about that, there is no way you can make any sense of that sentence or uh, any definite sense that is not another. Yes, and so the psychophysical activity is talking about here is this idea that you can first represent the different movements of the part. Yes, see, conceive or you would say model the different movements of the part. And once that has been done, you can then, in fact, use verbal orders that are guidance for the decision to do these movements together. This is the psychophysical activities talking about here. Uh, 
It's psych there is a psychic part, a mental part in this activity because of course you have to you have to reason that the torso mechanism is articulated, that different parts can move. You have to, in fact, uh, observe and uh, reason out where are the parts moving relative to each other? How many parts is the torso made of? How these different movements are related together? And then from that, this psychophysical activity or the indirect procedure is to think before I lift the arm in the air, I am not going to be concerned with the lifting of the arm in the air. I'm going to be concerned with the proper direction of the movements of the different parts of the torso. I am going to give myself instructions that are going to guide decisions that I must make all together, that is simultaneously, I must decide simultaneously to move the lower part of the torso, to move the middle part of the torso, and to move the upper part of the torso, all at the same time. And when you look at the picture again, you will find that, yes, in the way the person was lifting the arms, there is clearly the move a movement of the middle torso going forward and of the upper torso going back and of the lower part, the very lower part, the sitting bones, is the, the very lower part of the torso that are going backwards. So you can really easily uh, represent a curve. There is the two extremities of the curve and the center of the curve. That can be a starting point. And you think, okay, I am uh, pulling the extremity of the curve one direction. I am pulling the center of the curve in the opposite direction. As a result, I am increasing the shortening of the back. I am increasing the, protrude, the protruding of the abdominal part of the torso in that way. Yes, I am shortening. If I wanted to lengthen, well, you have to calculate then. You have to think, okay, I have to find a way and to, of course, limit the opposite movements. If you, you, you will want, of course, to have the extremities of the curve to go forward and the middle of the curve to go backward, but you understand that you can bend the torso both ways. You can bend the torso with the center of the curve forward or the center of the curve backward. Anyway, with the two movements, you bend. And bending is shortening, and shortening is compressing all the parts, and therefore, this is, can be considered as a wrong organization of the parts. So you will start to have something that, is, that you want and something that you do not want, and uh, we are talking geometry. We are not talking of feelings. You are not talking of a feeling of ease or feeling of, of compression. No, because your sensory appreciation, that guides the movement of arching the torso when you lift the arm. I can assure you that when the person is lifting the arm in this way, she's not feeling anything special. She's doing her habitual thing. There is no problem for her in that. The sensation is not a correct criterion of, of course, the expansion, the, I would say the geometric expansion of the torso, of course. So uh, when you uh, consider that, yes, there is a habit of arching the back when lifting the arms, that habit has not been solved by many, many somatic lessons, should have done the, the, the trick, but it has not. So you have to realize, you have to uh, come up to your senses and, and look at it and say, well, yes, it's not really working this. That's what I, that's what I thought. And uh, uh, I had uh, many videos of myself. I was giving many workshops at the time and I was filmed as part as teacher, uh, of course, uh, putting hands on people and uh, leading them toward the uh, fantastic uh, new organization uh, of the part that were, should be given by the technique. And uh, when I started to see myself, I started to think that, wow, I was still arching my back every, every, thing, every time I, I could. So then you are starting to think that this indirect activity, indirect procedure 
of reasoning, the movements, understanding this idea that uh, we are doing movements all the time, that trying to stop doing and having nice ideas in our head of, of uh, uh, non-doing, well, fine, they are nice uh, philosophical theories, but uh, the bridge to reach uh, the connection with practice does not exist. So it is possible that Alexander uh, suspected this. Uh, I don't uh, think he was a fool. And uh, it's quite interesting to, to read uh, his, his later books and to find out that, uh, well, first of all, he started to be a bit annoyed with his students. In the, less, the, the last book, it, it's quite clear that he's starting to criticize his followers very strongly. And he needs also to, uh, to explain again what he means by uh, these two opposite conceptions of change, of, of how to uh, proceed in order to obtain change, and how to proceed in order to change habits of mind and habits of the body that are going with it. The habit of mind is that you rely on feeling, and the habit of body is that, well, you're doing what you feel is light, what you feel is... Uh, uh, is uh, fluid what you feel is uh, is good and uh, that leads to uh, even more difficult habits to eradicate so in uh, 1942 Alexander writes uh, the last book and it is as books is uh, talking again about uh, uh, and gaining and means whereby principle and that is what he's going to say so these terms so these terms are ungaining principle and means whereby principle stand for two different, nay, opposite conception and two different procedures. According to the first or ungaining conception, all that is necessary when an end is desired is to proceed to employ the different parts of the organism in the manner which your feeling dictates as necessary for the carrying out of the movements requi required for gaining the end, irrespective of any harmful effects due to the misuse of the self during the process, a conception which implies the subordination of the thinking and reasoning self to the vagaries of the instinctive guidance and control of the self in carrying out the activities necessary to achieve the end. A great effort, again. <laughs> no, um, I understand that the sentences are long and uh, convoluted, but, um, well, what he's saying is, uh, is, quite, is quite clear. First of all, the context. We are in the context of the employment of the different parts of the organism in carrying out the movements required for gaining the end. We, we are not talking philosophy here, uh, strictly. We have this idea that uh, there are different parts in our organism. When we want, let's say, I want to learn to sit uh, with the least effort possible, with uh, the maximum uh, control. Uh, we are not discussing uh, the philosophy of, uh, of, I don't know, the organization of the COVID-19 uh, uh, system, how to, how to, in fact, uh, uh, change things outside of ourselves. We are, we, are, we are talking about our movements. So very often when some people are using the end-gaining uh, invective, it's, um, it, it's not reason in that strict sense. So um, when I use the end-gaining or when I discuss with my student about end-gaining, we, we, we have a conversation that is strictly bound to uh, the domain where the end gaining principle apply. There are principles that are of a greater magnitude that will apply everywhere. Well, the end gaining principles apply to uh, the decision you make 
to change how you uh, react with your physical organism. So that's that's a very important thing to to point out that that's what he wants to say here because many of his students have written well in, in 1946 it's already the case uh, I say 1946 because the edition I'm using is 1946 it was written in 1942 but already in 1942 Alexander has read and uh, uh, listened to his uh, student how his student had transformed the in fact conception of the end gaining principle in saying to people you are in gaining here uh, when the person is just uh, for example uh, making an effort to lift something making an effort to lift something uh, you you cannot tell whether it's in gaining or whether it's a, uh, an application of the means whereby principle it's not possible let's imagine that the first time the person is going to guide a, a new series of movements of course the person is going to feel so strange and it will be so out or uh, uh, habitual uh, activities that the person is going to show signs of strain signs of strain do not uh, indicate end gaining at all you can be completely involved in the means whereby system and uh, be uh, in fact uh, perceiving all sorts of strains and showing a part of the strain you perform because we are uh, social creatures and we tend when we uh, extend for example to make a face and to say that this is in gaining is like um, placarding people. It's like saying to people, you, you shouldn't explore, you shouldn't try. Because um, if there is a tension, well, there, of course there is tension. We are to expand. Antagonistic actions are to uh, create a new expansion of the torso when we have been used to shortening the torso. So yes. Uh, the correct understanding of the word tension is that there is a mechanical effect when you stretch an elastic tissue. And yes, uh, but to say that you are engaining because of that is just purely stupid. So there is a domain to use a concept like engaining, like means whereby. And here, Alexander, well, really puts the finger and he, he you know he crosses the t and he says that's where we have to think in this way so so there are movements alexander uh, as a, in his sentence he, he says that um, in the end gaining system uh, we proceed to employ the different parts of the organism in the manner which your feeling dictates as necessary so uh, that is opening the the way for the means whereby principle where uh, in order to employ the different parts of the organism uh, we are going to find a, a manner dictated not by our feeling but by a reasoning understanding and analysis of the system, of the mechanism we are uh, deciding to uh, change, yes? And so uh, he says also that we carry out these movements according to what we feel, irrespective of any harmful effects due to me use of the self during the process. And it's very interesting to, um, when you look at uh, the incorrect organization, incorrect movements of the part of the torso of a somatic person, uh, of somatic guided person, is to realize that the person has uh, developed what she would say is uh, sensory awareness. That's the idea. But that that sensory awareness uh, is completely incompetent in, in fact, telling that person. What is the different movements of the part she's making? Sensory awareness is, uh, is very limited when you try to follow a series of activities going on at the same time and uh, converging to the same end. 
of course, that is exactly what the, the use of the mechanism of the torso is about. There are different movements. These different movements act at the same time and following different movements at the same time with the feeling sense is inappropriate. But uh, when he says irrespective of the, any harmful effects is that uh, if you watch a film of the person lifting the arms in the air, well, then you can uh, very quickly, well, you don't have to convince yourself that something is wrong. It's plain to see. You know, it's not, it's not a, uh, something that you should have a special gift of feeling in order to perceive with your hands. No, the person is shortening the back and that's it. And you see it. And if the person was, in fact, using reasoning, reasoning her mind, she would very quickly understand. And if there is a possibility that the sensory appreciation is incorrect, well, it's absolutely necessary to get another view on the system and that it's absolutely necessary to, in fact, start to look at the movement she's producing. And nowadays, with uh, the modern equipment, with cameras, with computers everywhere, it's so simple. You just film yourself. Uh, it's absolutely amazing because even my students, I, uh, I have many students uh, that, have, that are taking a uh, long distance lesson with me. And uh, when they start having lesson with me, I tell them, I say, um, I'm just going to uh, start a session with you. We are going to create a film together. That film is the lesson. And uh, it's just the beginning. When you, uh, you will see yourself performing and see what are the different movements. I will point to the different movements of the different parts. We are going to name the parts. We are going to reason how they are jointed together, how they move, how they, what is the possibility, the range of movements of two different parts of the torso, for example, is a very simple question. Well, we can impress and project to the camera exactly the movements as they are occurring when you perform them, and we can perform the wrong and the right movement so that you can make yourself an idea of what it is you want to stop, what movements you want to stop yourself from doing, this idea of uh, uh, definite inhibition, definite inhibition of movements, and uh, what you want to see. And you will uh, clearly uh, recognize when the different movements acting together are producing a new result that is uh, completely different from the shortening that was presented in the first image and uh, a new lengthening. And you will, uh, you will see on screen that you are not feeling this. You, you, are, you have no uh, feeling recognition of the correct thing, even uh, when, you, when you see it on screen. So, uh, the subordination of the thinking to the feeling is uh, incorrect. This idea that, uh, uh, well, reasoning is, uh, is a suspect. Uh, most people have this idea nowadays that uh, uh, when you reason, you don't feel. When you reason, you go away from your somatic uh, existence. <laughs> that is very funny. <laughs> Coming from people that have uh, studied the Alexander Technique principles, you, you wonder, you think, wow, that is really a strange uh, misunderstanding of what me we mean by uh, body-mind uh, unity, inactivity, yes? Uh, so the person will then uh, hear this, this, but what I wanted to say is that even with my own students, I say to them, you see, uh, this practice you've done with me is a, it's just once, it's just a starting point. What you need to do is to reproduce these experiments by yourself. The, these are experiments where you give yourself different orders. You concert them in your mind. You think, okay, I want to decide to make this movement and this movement and this movement at the same time. And when I will say one, I will start when I say three, I stop. 
it's a, a basic uh, experiment of conscious guidance and then you watch on the film how it looks is it going in the right direction are the movements according to what you say did the movement start at the same time okay months later most people will tell me well i, I never did really uh, feel myself <laughs> <laughs> oh dear why not well um, well I thought the lesson was the lesson in fact oh you said uh, you thought the session we had together was the lesson yes but did I not say otherwise yes but I, I don't think I understood at the time <laughs> what you meant you know there, there is this uh, this uh, fear of uh, just control simple control as if controlling yourself controlling how you translate uh, intentions into action was a problem no it's not a problem it's the center of the conscious guidance and control system it's uh, wanting to uh, verify what is the uh, the result of orders you give yourself orders well you want to see if you obey or not and uh, there is no other way you can guide your um, your progress in the new uh, construction of uh, well positive habits it's very it's very simple and so, this is this is what fm alexander was doing with the mirrors yes yes it's much more difficult to do with mirrors because uh, uh we we really have a, a very an immense advantage uh, compared to him is that what you see in mirrors is happening at the moment you do something so you have no distanciation and so it's like nearly impossible not to uh, in interrupt or uh, try to influence what you're doing what you're seen doing in the mirror well you if, if most people don't realize but if you fall into this tragic uh, problem is that uh, when you have no mirrors well you're still uh, you're still back to the same idea because at the moment when you interfere with the pro uh, the proceeding which is i'm I'm thinking of uh, three decisions and if I see myself in the mirror and I see that one is not going well I may well try to do something with that uh, instructions and as a result forget the others so we, we cannot say that this is concerted activity while when you film yourself of course, uh, there is always the possibility to watch your screen and to see yourself doing it but that's, uh, that's the same problem with the mirror. So you decide that you're going to do, uh, to film yourself uh, and the screen is turned elsewhere so that you cannot see what it is you're doing. It's the only proper way to, to construct conscious guidance. And so you have a certain number of instruction. You will tell them aloud to the camera so that when you watch the film, you will, have, uh, you will listen to what are the orders that are prior to the uh, performance and you perform the new gesture well let's say sitting or standing for example and you decide that you're going to pull uh, the extra the upper extremity and the lower extremity forward and the middle extremity back let's say a very simple thing like this and you you you, you just count to three to sit and count to three to stand and then uh, you stop the, the video recording and then straight away if you want you can watch it and you watch it and you think, okay, I'm not doing what I say I was going to do. How come I'm doing the opposite? So then you have uh, the, this reasoning that comes in. You think, okay, um, I, must, I must be doing something that I feel correct associated with standing or sitting. I must uh, find a solution and decide that, well, I really need to feel absolutely strange if I want to go in the right directions, which means that I want the extremities to go one way and the center in the other way. And, and then you go and you start the, the new film, a new experiment of conscious guidance with the same orders, but this time you think to yourself, 
uh, I have to concert disorders uh, and uh, accept to feel absolutely wrong. Otherwise, systematically, I see that the lower torso is going back when I reach toward the chair, systematically. And I'm pushed back and I, I can't understand why there is something that is happening like this. Well, if not, well, uh, maybe I need to rethink maybe I need to start to understand that the movement of the part of the torso and the movement of the knees and ankle and feet are somehow related. Am I not doing something with my feet when I sit every single time? Is there no rotation that is going on? I don't know yet why a rotation would make me go back with the lower part of the torso when I sit, but if I do go back with the lower part of the torso, I'm certain to arch the back and I will see it. So if I want to stop that habit, I need to maybe uh, start a new investigation into the means whereby movements. Maybe the means whereby movements I'm using at the moment are crude and not sufficient. And there are other things that are impacting on the coordination. So we, by this imply the subordination of the thinking and reasoning self, not to uh, the instinctive guidance and control, not to the feeling, but to, well, uh, appropriate analysis. And uh, by appropriate analysis, I mean it can only be objective analysis in order to solve the problem. That's uh, as simple as that. So, um, the ungaining procedure involves the idea of going uh, direct for the end. By direct for the end uh, is to say, uh, I'm not going to consider the movements, the means whereby movement, which is the, or the orders I give myself. How many orders I give myself? Most people would just say, I want the back to lengthen. Well, Yes, but uh, what are the means whereby for the back to lengthen, if you see that you have been using uh, an instruction that says back to lengthen and widen for years, and that your film with the back shortening and narrowing, <laughs> it seems that the means whereby that you're using are not appropriate, that, they are, uh, that you must define the movement that make the back lengthen and widen. That's how I started to, to, to reason about all this. I started to realize that uh, uh, neck free, let the neck be free and back to lengthen and widen uh, are orders that are not means whereby orders. By definition, they don't uh, detail how uh, you can obtain the result, how you can obtain the end. So I started to use the definition given by, by Alexander to, in fact, scrutinize his teaching, his pedagogy. How can you say to people, uh, you should not end gain and give end gaining orders? <laughs> Makes no sense. Or the orders are not new orders of movements. It's possible that you can, uh, and that's how I, uh, I finally uh, could uh, resolve that uh, very strange uh, idea of using the wrong means in order to, to develop your own pedagogy is Alexander says never to, neck, to um, put in practice neck, neck free or back to length and then widen that these orders are in fact uh, orders of inhibition. They are not orders of definite performance. Yes, but how many people are trying to, in fact, uh, uh, have a subconscious direction of the body by saying to themselves, if I think like the back to lengthen, widen, and think it really calmly and without any idea of doing, it's going to happen by itself. Okay? Yes? If you follow this practice, never film yourself. <laughs> because uh, if you do film yourself, you will find that uh, you're nowhere near uh, the solution of the plan. No, nope. it's getting worse and worse. And uh, I've, I've got pictures, uh, I've taken pictures of teachers of the modern Alexander technique nearly all my uh, my life and uh, I have so many examples 
where the somatic system does not work in practice. That it's, for me, it's not a question anymore. It's absolutely clear. So, uh, in the end gaining plan, Alexander um, puts forward the idea that there is uh, this idea of trial and error. You, if, if you do it uh, time and time again, you will refine your way of doing it. Wrong. The trial and error that never works. You're trying and trying and trying to lengthen the back and to think and, and, and to feel into it and to, and it's, it's never working, never. So, um, of course, there are people that can impress for, for a second an audience with uh, uh, their ways and, and the fact that they can uh, direct the attention of the audience to the student to, with which they are working with and creating somatic wonders that the person is feeling so light and so great. But uh, we need to, have, uh, to, uh, to understand and go back to this idea. Yes, but how is the person uh, organizing the movements of the different parts of the structure relatively to, uh, well, the point of contact with the floor all the time? And, uh, and it's, it's clear at that moment that, uh, well, there is some end gaining. For example, when you are tired and, uh, well, of course, there is a uh, feeling that is associated with it that you recognize very clearly. And, so, and then, so you've, you've given your workshop and, uh, and then you, you sit in a sofa and, and you don't think of the movements and you just uh, go back into the old uh, and gaining procedure of trying to feel good by leaning, by compressing the torso, by reproducing all the incorrect movements. So you think, oh yes, there is no end to this. It's uh, this idea of and gaining and means well by principles are always there. Not only when you are in representation, always. And uh, to be true to oneself, you have to understand that we are all confronted with this. Because the and gaining uh, concept is uh, the first concept we use as uh, as babies. We have no understanding at first. The means whereby principle can only be a later construction. It's an intellectual higher level than the end gaining principle. The end gaining principle, doing according to what you feel, is um, is really really basic. But its grip on our mind is very very strong we have to recognize it you can't change something you don't see and so before uh inflicting the and gaining uh, word to other people it's uh, it's good to have a look at your at your own activity even as a teacher i say this to me is that uh, very often i am uh, applying the and gaining plan I'm, I'm, I'm trying, uh, and uh, the trial and error idea is that you perform a set, uh, a complex activity. So there are many movements involved and you evaluate it by feeling. Were you right? Were you, was it fluid? Was it light? And uh, so you do it again. And every time we learn a new things, uh, my son has a, has a new game. It's a pogo jumper. A pogo jumper is a stick uh, with uh, some sort of uh, elastic mechanism so that you can jump on it. It's a very interesting uh, equilibrium uh, game, this. Because at first, you find that uh, you, can't, you can't just uh, rebound. You're falling. To rebound, you have to organize, of course, the movements of the feet and the movement of the hands, which means the whole torso uh, in a very uh, clear way so that it will use the, the correct axis in order to compress the, the spring so that you can spring, spring up. And um, at first, you are going to use a trial and error way. Uh, to, to stop a second and reason is uh, so uh, the only way I found is that uh, to stop and reason you film. <laughs> I want to see what is happening when I'm doing it. I want to see what are the trajectories of the different, what 
what it is I am doing with the different parts of the torso, shoulders, are because the arms and shoulders are involved because you have to, of course, the, the pogo is, you, you hold the pogo by a sort of, uh, of a bar, a, a horizontal bar on which you, and, and there is an horizontal bar for, for the feet and that's all, and the spring. And you just uh, and you see an uh, eight-year-old and he's just uh, uh, jumping around uh, on the the patio here and uh, going upstairs, downstairs, and you just can't make two um, two two jumps. You know, it's like wow. <laughs> and uh, the first idea is uh, you're not thinking of filming yourself to see exactly what are the movements you are doing. You have this idea that you you will crack it. You will uh, you. You will make it work. It will work according to what you feel. It's going to work. Well, according to what you feel, it may you may of course uh, start and use the pogo jumper, but it's going to be. Uh, first of all, you're not going to improve your manner of guiding the different movements of the parts. That's for sure. You're going to reproduce your habits, and so you're going to reach very very quickly uh, the glass ceiling and uh, the end of hope <laughs> most people don't understand that idea but it's uh, it's the idea that according to your present coordination there are a few things you can do yes but uh, there will be a moment when according to your current coordination you will not improve anymore no matter how many hours of trial and error you will put into it you can put, you, if you are really, really uh, uh, strong-minded, you can put hours and hours and hours into it. And you will find that instead of uh, improving, no, it's the opposite that is occurring. That's the glass ceiling of, uh, of and gaining coordination. And uh, if you want to go one stage higher at one moment, as a human being, you need your reasoning. The oh dear, the awful idea of reasoning comes back into the picture and you start to think, okay, I should have started from the first part to just see if when I decided I wanted to make a certain move, I was, move, I was moving in the direction indicated. The idea of control is, uh, is something that is very problematic with the somatic system. The somatic system is, if you control only by what you feel, you are going to fear being filmed. You are going to fear being, there are teachers that were, that, that were adamant, they didn't want any pictures taken of themselves. They didn't want to show, uh, or, I don't know, they, they, they had a fear of, of being judged, I don't, I, I, I can't exactly explain why, but they, they were adamant. I know a few of them, adamant. They would not, they didn't want to be taken on pictures. Some others didn't care. <laughs> yes, but um, uh, I, I tend to respect the one that didn't want to, be, to, to get uh, filmed because uh, I thought, well, why is it they don't want to be filmed? They, uh, it's, it's quite, Strange, you're a teacher of movement and uh, you are an example for all your students. You have to understand that. The way you, you move, the way you stand is an example. And even if you do reach up with the arms and arch your back, you're going to communicate that uh, coordination to the person. That's Alexander was, uh, was clear about that and I've seen it happen that some, uh, some students could be uh, seen as a student of somebody because you could see the same uh, uh, problems, the same, you know, uh, peculiarities in their use. It had and with, been with regard to being filmed, people know that they're going to feel nervous or embarrassed when they get filmed. And if they're doing everything according to feeling, then they're going to feel like they're not doing it as well as they were doing it before. Yes, it's possible, yes. Uh, this idea of uh, being nervous when film is, uh, is true. I, I hear it many times, but I, I always uh, explain to my pupils that we are involved in uh, exploring, we are involved in studying, and we have a, a very uh, clear understanding that there are faults in anyone 
uh, you have faults, I have, have many faults. So hiding the faults is not, is not going to help us get a clear analysis of the problem and the solution. So we, yeah, there is a need to explore. And very quickly, uh, it's like um, a swimming. You, you don't know if the water is warm. And so you fear and you, you stay on the border and at one moment you have to jump. Okay, everybody's in the water, everybody's swimming, having a good time and you're still uh, thinking, oh dear, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm well enough. Of course, go and jump. Well, with filming, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, as soon as you've started to uh, film yourself and uh, just uh, analyze in a very precise ways which movements you're making and discovering that through this analysis, you can improve your way of ordering yourself and that when ordering yourself in the new way you're improving, well, the whole process uh, ceases to be an emotional problem. And you very quickly start to analyze yourself on the video the same way as you would another person. Yes. You, you separate yourself emotionally from uh, the, the movements that you did and you don't care about these things. You just you start reasoning, which, of course, is what Alexander yeah. talks about all the time in the early books. Reason and reasoning. Okay. Thank you, Jean Doe. You're welcome. Um, everyone listening and watching the video, you can get links to Jean Doe's websites underneath. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Jondo. Thank you, Kevin. Bye. Bye-bye.